Hi, this is Dustin Lee. I'm one of the attending physicians in the emergency department at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. We're going to be discussing management of pediatric GI foreign bodies today. Management of pediatric foreign bodies can be challenging. You don't always know if anything was ingested or what it was. Having a basic working understanding of who you can follow as an outpatient, who should be admitted for observation, and who needs emergent GI or surgical consultation is important, uh, whether you're working in a community or at a large academic center. We're going to be discussing some of the high-risk ingestions, such as multiple magnets, uh, miniature handguns, sharp objects, and what are some of the clinical signs of distress for ongoing pain, crepitus, drooling, recurrent vomiting, we wanted to cover topics today that are applicable not only just to the emergency physician at, at a large pediatric uh, facility, however some of those for pediatric residents that rotate through family medicine residents as well as com community providers who may be taking calls from outside facilities, be seeing patients in the clinic, or be performing some of that initial workup uh, in the inpatient facility that we admit to. Children put stupid things in their mouths. And the good thing is the majority of foreign bodies um, do pass through the GI tract spontaneously. Most of these are going to occur in children between the ages of six months and three years of age. And it's important to have an understanding because approximately uh, 80,000 cases of foreign body ingestion happen each year. About 10 to 20 percent of these will require endoscopic emergency uh, removal and only less than one percent of these will ultimately require surgical intervention. Most cases of GI foreign body are witnessed. However, is it important to listen and to believe the parent, both the patient and the parent? There are uh, reports out there of long-standing retained esophageal or GI foreign bodies, which lead to weight loss, decreased PO, recurrent aspiration, or decreased caloric intake. Generally, management for most object involves monitoring. Uh, they do not involve induced emesis or giving cathartics. So most of the time how we initially start with these patients is a physical exam, so assessing the patient. How do they look? Are they uh, lethargic? Are they breathing? That may suggest it not just be in the GI, but actually aspirated. Um, assessing the oral pharynx. Sometimes you can see the object in the back of the throat and potentially grab it with the McGill's. However, patients that you don't see it, and they're still uh, important to retain a high degree of clinical suspicion. Uh, as with any patient that we see in the ER, it's important to assess the ABCs, and part of this e includes ex examining the neck, which may uh, reveal swelling or crepitus, suggesting esophageal perforation, and the need for emergent surgical consultation. Um, additional exams, including uh, assessing the respiratory system to make sure there's not unilateral wheezing, checking the abdomen, which also may show evidence of small bowel obstruction or perforation. If stable, the initial management of these patients is going to be with an AP and lateral plane films looking at the neck, chest, and abdomen. When patients do have symptoms occur, they typically happen to where the foreign body is lodged. Uh, in, for us in the emergency department, it's important to have an understanding of where physiologically this occurs, and there are specific areas of narrowing within the esophagus. Number one, at the cricopharyngeus muscle, number two at the level of the aortic arch, and, and third at the lower esophageal sphincter. This patient on the left picture is an example of a 20-month-old female who initially presented the emergency department after swallowing a coin. They were playing with uh, their two older siblings uh, who reported to the mother that the patient swallowed a coin. Um, so part of the initial survey, as we mentioned, is with plain films. As you see in this one, there's only an AP view and not the lateral view. When pulled in closer in the top right picture, you can see the, in the periphery the small rim, which actually suggests this is a battery, not a coin. Additional views, as you can see in the bottom two pictures, demonstrate a uh, bi-leveled appearance to uh, batteries. And there is a difference in, in approach in how we manage these patients, whether it be a coin or a battery, and depending on where that's lodged in the uh, GI tract. Let's be honest, coins are delicious. Uh, they are the most common foreign body ingested by children. Uh, only a small percentage will stay in the esophagus, and actually on 
two-thirds of patients on in the initial plain films will already be passed into the stomach. Coins are non-toxic and they are not sharp, so again, most of these can be monitored. However, if you do get those initial plain films and you see a coin that's lodged in the distal esophagus, it should be monitored closely, especially if they're symptomatic. If they're asymptomatic and it's still in the esophagus, you can repeat plain films within 24 hours, and if it's still there, just due to risk of local irritation, uh, the coin should be removed. If beyond the esophagus, most coins will pass uneventfully within a week or two. And so the general recommendation is to follow approximately once per week with a plain film of the GI tract. Uh, if it has not passed from the stomach in about four weeks, the general recommendation is for endoscopic removal just to avoid uh, formation of long-term bezoars. Batteries, management depends on the location. Batteries lodged in the esophagus are considered a medical emergency and should be referred either to the ER uh, for discussion with GI or ENT um, or admitted to the uh, pediatric ICU for removal. The reason is, is they cause uh, damage to the esophagus via three mechanisms. Number one, the batteries can cause a direct pressure necrosis with a lack of cirrhosis in the esophagus the batteries can wear through directly through the soft tissue. Additionally, they can cause a caustic injury. These batteries have a high rate of leakage and the sodium or potassium hydroxide can di directly damage the tissue. Uh, the esophagus is uh, also prone to sustaining injury from low voltage burns as the disc battery is stimulated both from the positive and negative, negative terminal on the battery. Um, those batteries that do pass the esophagus typically can just be followed. However, in my experience, uh, GI will often take these out if they can get after them if they're still lodged in the stomach or proximal duodenum. The length of the object in the GI tract does make a difference. Long objects such as toothbrushes or spoons, uh, while not sharp, generally will not pass all the way through the GI tract. Typically, when objects are in the intermediate range from about 4 to 5 centimeters, they will pass the stomach. However, only 50% will pass the ileocecal region, which is the most narrow region between the small and large bowel. Um, so if still in the stomach on initial presentation, it's recommended that these objects come out. As opposed to the objects in the prior slide, sharp objects have a high rate of complication, uh, estimated up to 35% at risk of perforation or stricture formation. And it depends again on where these are located within GI tract. Pins and needles and paper clips are commonly swallowed in uh, infants and uh, typically require emergent removal. If in the esophagus, it is recommended to discuss with uh, the pediatric GI team for endoscopic removal. Uh, more proximal to that in the hypopharynx may lead to small perforation in retropharyngeal abscess which can develop anywhere from days to weeks after initial event. Those objects that are retained in the stomach or duodenum um, typically have um, a need to come out, however not quite as emergently, uh, due to the high risk of down the road complication. These objects do need to come out though, so it's recommended that we still talk to a pediatric GI to perform endo endoscopy. If it's beyond where you can grab it with an endoscope, uh, up to three days at a time, you can follow these patients. However, it should be done uh, very closely. Um, you can perform daily or every other day uh, x-rays to make sure that they're passing uh, as long as the patient's asymptomatic. Clearly, if they have severe abdominal pain, they need to come in and have a surgical consultation. However, if it's a small paperclip or a small pin that looks like it's progressing in the GI tract, you can typically watch these patients. Single magnets ingested are typically are managed similar to coins or other blunt objects with a low incidence of toxicity and they're often not sharp for, uh, with a risk of perforation. Uh, it is very important though to ensure that multiple magnets have not been ingested as ma uh, management significantly differs. Additionally, those patients who ingest a magnet with an additional metal object, we manage typically as with other metal objects. So those patients who come in uh, who are otherwise asymptomatic, you do your AP and lateral films and you see a single magnet, you can typically just follow these patients with a caveat that they need to stay away from things such as metal buttons, metal Jesus chains, or other, uh, other metal devices that may uh, attract a, a magnet within the GI tract. 
Multiple magnets, however, require slightly different management. Uh, in the picture in the bottom right, you may see that multiple magnets have the risk of causing local pressure necrosis due to attraction. This can lead to fistula formation, infections, bowel obstructions, and the need is for these magnets to come out emergently if possible. Um, ideally, you grab them while they're in the stomach or esophagus. However, if they've progressed beyond this, uh, oftentimes a consultation with a surgeon is required for removal. Rarely, uh, when there are multiple magnets, you can follow these patients. However, the recommendation would not be, as with other blunt objects, every other day to one week, but for approximately every six hours, you should be following them with a chest x-ray or abdominal x-ray. Oftentimes, an x-ray is not good enough to show if there's bowel wall uh, compressed between the magnets, so a high degree of clinical suspicion and a low threshold to consult surgery for consideration of removal is, is required. Classically, on our emergency medicine boards, uh, there are pictures demonstrating a coin or a battery lodged in the esophagus or trachea. The picture shown is a classic presentation with, on the lateral view, a flat picture of a coin, as it's typically thought to go through the vocal cords and lodge in this orientation. However, if you look closely on the picture on the left, you, you see the air from the trachea just lateral left to the object. And this is actually located in the esophagus. So remember, your esophagus does not read books and make sure and assess the entire film uh, completely. Most objects we've discussed today have been radio opaque. However, the norm is for radiolucent objects. And so again, it is important to believe the patient and believe the parent if they say that they've witnessed an object ingested. Again, most of these will pass through spontaneously. However, it is important to initially perform the AP and lateral x-rays. Patients who develop signs of bowel obstruction may need advanced imaging. Uh, this case above is an example of a patient who was 18 months old and nine months down the road had developed some nausea with recurrent vomiting and abdominal distension. They came into the emergency department where plain films demonstrate no object but a stepladder appearance of the bowel suggestive of bowel obstruction. CT scan was performed as noted before uh, below which demonstrates a small rubber ducky that mother now recalled missing from the patient's bathtub nine months earlier. Few patients will require surgical intervention. Again, by all numbers, all comers who come to the emergency department, this will actually be only less than 1%. Uh, those patients will be those with clinical signs of perforation, such as distended abdomen, severe abdominal pain, recurrent vomiting, or those with high risk ingestion, such as objects that are long, objects that are short, sharp, mul multiple magnets that are failing to progress. As a brief review, there are a couple of objects that are considered high risk and some that are just commonly ingested, such as coins. A few things to keep in mind. The size of the object does make a difference. Those that are intermediate, while they may pass the stomach, those four to five centimeters rarely pass the ileocecal valve. As they get larger, six to 10 centimeters, they really pass the stomach, and so they should come out endoscopically. Sharp objects, again, have a high rate of long-term complications, cited at anywhere from five to 35%. So those commonly ingested objects, such as pins and needles and paper clips, should come out while they're uh, able to be retrieved within the esophagus or stomach. However, those beyond um, grasp of the endoscope can be followed closely and uh, at a three-day trial of passage. Those beyond that require surgical consultation. Magnets, single magnets, you can, if you avoid other metal objects, um, you can give them the trial of passage. Again, they're low, low risk of toxicity or complication. However, multiple objects should be removed emergently. Batteries, similarly, when located in the esophagus, they need to come out. However, if they're beyond their close observation with serial plane films is appropriate. Coins, again, are the most commonly ingested objects, and as long as they're beyond the esophagus, most can just be watched and uh, managed as an outpatient. We'll uh, plan to post this on the blog site. For any other questions, please send an email uh, or 
join in discussion for uh, further management or recommendations for pediatric GI foreign bodies.